Hey everybody, welcome to Tech for Psych, where we combine the latest in neurotechnology, the ancient wisdom to supercharge your brain. I'm Dr. Cody Rowling, your medical doctor confidant. In this video, we're gonna take a look at the Muse devices and if they actually work or not. It's been seven years since Interaxon put out its first Muse 2014 device, followed by the 2016 device, and later by Muse 2 and Muse S. Now, understandably, there's still some skeptics out there if these devices actually are able to interpret your brain waves and give you good feedback for meditation, and if that that meditation actually helps to increase your cognitive skills. So just as a review, if you haven't used this device before, the Muse headband uh, reads your brain waves and actually tells you whether or not you're being distracted and takes you through meditative exercises. And you get feedback on that. If you've got uh, a good sustained attention, you should hear birds in the soundscape. If you get distracted, you'll hear rain and wind so that you know to come back to the breath to complete your meditation session and you get scores at the end. Now I've talked about some of these concepts and we've looked at scientific papers on this channel in the past, but there's a lot of new literature out. And I figured that since I'm launching my brain circuit training program next month, that it would be a good time to catch everybody up to speed on what latest studies have been done. And for those of you who don't know, my brain circuit training program uses the Muse headband with the mind lift system to do neurofeedback exercises to assist your meditation. I do wanna say that I've fallen behind on submissions with my move to Las Vegas and having to set up the new studio and everything. So if you've submitted recently to participate in the brain circuit training program, just hit reply on that email that you already sent so I know that you are still interested in the program and we'll get you training with the mind lift system here real soon. I've updated most of the videos and used what I learned from previous cohorts to update and improve the program. So I'm really excited to launch it next month. Now, the three main questions that I get most on YouTube and in emails are as follows. Number one, do these headbands actually track what's going on in the brain? Number two, does technology supported meditation actually help you meditate better and increase cognitive abilities as a result? And number three, is this type of meditation right for me? Is technology assisted meditation right for your specific needs? So let's take a look at the first question. Does the Muse headband actually measure what's going on inside of your brain? I've talked about this on this channel before, but one of my favorite researchers in this area is Dr. Olaf Krigolson out of University of Victoria. He's an independent researcher that takes a look at many different things, including cognitive fatigue in humans. And in his 2017 paper, Choosing Muse, what they looked at was comparing the Muse headband, which costs anywhere between $250 and $350, to a gold standard EEG machine called ActiChamp that costs upwards of $80,000. And what they did was either put the Muse headband on people or hook them up to the ActiChamp system and have them go through an oddball paradigm test. Basically, an oddball paradigm test shows you two different things. In this test, it was either a green dot or a blue dot and if it was a green dot you would tap the screen of the tablet if it was a blue dot you were not supposed to tap the screen there were more green dots than blue dots making the blue dot the oddball. So what happens is when you see the oddball is that you get a uh, evoke related potential brainwave pattern. And what they are able to show is that through reaction time and those ERPs, you can measure the amount of cognitive fatigue that a person has. How tired are they trying to keep track of uh, which dot was which and keeping focus on the screen. And then they were able to show that the corresponding electrodes on the ActiChamp system were comparable to what was found on the Muse. But even more exciting was that the Muse setup time took like 10 minutes per subject, whereas the ActiChamp setup required a cap and gel and two lab assistants and took over an hour to do for each person. And the reason why this is exciting is because for these types of studies, you want large sample sizes. You would much rather have a thousand people in a study than 10 people in a study. And as a result, setup time is really important to get good data. Not only that, but the Mu system is mobile, so you can take it into different environments and measure cognitive fatigue on things like what he did with the NASA project where they had the Mars Habitat project in Hawaii and they could measure the cognitive fatigue of the people taking part in that study, which was really exciting. Okay, so now that you have that background, we can talk about the newer studies that have come out through Dr. Craig Olson's lab. First of all, his study findings were replicated by another independent group, Fickling et al. So that was exciting. They were able to show as well that their findings is that the Muse headband can track ERPs similar to the ActiChamp system. 
system. And also Dr. Kriegolson's group followed up that original 2017 study with a much more robust group of over a thousand test participants in taking a look at cognitive fatigue with the Muse headband. They found some really interesting data. Basically, there are points on the ERP with the N200 and P300 points that are of interest in the ERP characteristics, as well as different neural oscillatory patterns in the delta, theta, alpha, and beta ranges. And what they concluded in that recent study, of which the paper just came out in January 2021, is that they can take all of those metrics in a linear regression model and better predict cognitive fatigue in humans. So that work is evolving and it is so cool to see the Muse headband being used in that capacity. Basically, in my opinion, and you can judge for yourself, but if all these different third-party researchers are using the Muse headband in such type of research and publishing papers, peer-reviewed papers, and working with organizations such as NASA, I think that the EEG signal coming out of the Muse is worth something at least. It might not be perfect, but it is good enough to do some really interesting work, especially in the area of cognitive fatigue and related studies. All right, so moving on to question number two, does technology-assisted meditation, neurofeedback meditation, actually help you meditate better? Does it have measurable effects on your ability to have different cognitive skills like attention, memory, relaxation, and other associated measures? Well, we do have a small randomized controlled trial that was done with the Muse headband to take a look at these different measures. Now, admittedly, I know that some of the authors on this paper, to include Graham Moffat, were actually working for Interaxon, so I wouldn't call this a completely independent third-party study, but I mean, this does happen in industry all the time where companies will sponsor research done by scientists, and it still goes through a peer review process. So I'm taking uh, the information in this study as worthwhile at taking a look at, even though Interaxon was involved, which happens in research all the time. So what they did was recruit a number of test subjects and only included the data if they went through all the Muse sessions. And what they were doing was training 10 minutes a day for six weeks, and and then measuring outcomes that came of that. So they did pre-testing and post-testing, and they actually did find improvements in cognitive abilities between before and after the training. And by the way, the control group that they did was a group of people that simply just did math exercises for six weeks through Khan Academy. So they had their experimental group with the Muse headband for six weeks, and the control group with people just doing math questions through Khan Academy for six weeks. They were able to show that those people that were using the Muse headband performed better on a Stroop test, which tests both attention and executive function. It's basically that test that shows uh, words of color names in different colors, and you have to pick whether or not the actual word matches the color that the, the text is in. It's kind of difficult <laughs> if you've ever tried it before. They were also able to show some improvements in subjective measures like body awareness, calm, and then uh, less depression or anxiety symptoms on a brief symptom inventory scale. So that was published in 2016. So we do have a small randomized controlled trial showing that technology-assisted meditation can be beneficial both in uh, objective evidence of cognitive skills and subjective uh, ratings of how people tend to feel once they're done with the training. Now, granted, I think that they stated the obvious that more work needs to be done with larger sample sizes. I don't know if they're working on that right now. I wouldn't be surprised if they are doing so, but at least we do have some evidence for that moving forward. And finally, the third question, is this type of neurofeedback meditation right for you? Uh, what type of person responds well to this type of meditation neurofeedback? Well, there was this really interesting qualitative study that Interaxon actually posted on their Muse headband website. It was from author Caroline Stockman of University of Winchester, who actually took six people that didn't know that they were gonna use the Muse headband and basically asked before and after questions and several rating scales on how they actually responded to the technology. The idea was, what are these different people's predispositions? Are they open to new technology or do they think that meditation should just be done without uh, technology? And then we're given the devices and through a series of interviews, uh, she lays it out in the paper and you actually get snippets of the transcripts within the paper. So if you ever wanted to be a fly on the wall to see how different people react to using the Muse headband with meditation, I recommend that you take a look at the study because it's really interesting. Some of the things that stuck out for me is that, uh, you know, there was all different types of people in this study. There was uh, individuals that originally thought that uh, you shouldn't use technology to assist your meditation and then got through the four required trainings and actually said, hey, there's some benefit here. I really like this. I really like this 
this idea of uh, using technology to assist meditation. And of course, there was one or two individuals that hated it. <laughs> they didn't like it all trying to get the uh, device to help teach them to meditate. And we'll talk about the reasons why here in a second. Another thing that stood out for me is that when the subjects initially saw the device, they reported that it looked, quote, a bit scary or it was something out of Tron, basically. And it's funny because I've been talking about these devices for so long that I forget what people's first impressions are of them. I, I forget that it's not widely mainstream yet and that people think that using technology to assist their meditation is really alien. And so that reminds me that the general population is still getting used to this technology and I think it takes a certain type of person to get into it. Some people think that it looks really cool so they wanna get involved, but other people have an element of fear with uh, interacting with the technology. So I think that that will improve as the years go on, especially as uh, future generations get more used to uh, having wearables on their body. But um, even within this generation, I think that people get will get more used to it, just like we got used to having smartphones on us all the time. Most of the people in the study agreed that for the right person, this technology could be very beneficial. Someone that's open to technology, someone that has a relatively high frustration tolerance for learning new things and uh, would get really good feedback from this type of technology for improving their meditation. So basically this paper identified three main themes that will discourage someone from using this device. This is such good data for understanding why a new person to this technology would not want to use this headband sometimes. Number one was the range. If you get a lot of rain in the feedback, it can be very discouraging. You feel like you're not uh, meditating right and you can't get it right and you get frustrated and you feel like it's just not responding to you. And that was number two. If you feel like your internal state is not reflected in the feedback, say you feel really calm but you hear rain, that is going to be discouraging as well. And number three was adaptability to technology. Are you open to new things? Are you open to using new technology? Sometimes you get people that just don't even like computers so they might not like to use this device. So those might seem obvious, but hearing it described in this paper was really helpful for me and I'm sure it was helpful for Interaxon as well. As they get their calibration methods more individualized to the individual person for using the neurofeedback technology, hopefully people will feel like the feedback is matching their internal state even better, making them want to engage in the technology more. My one criticism of Interaxon, and this is easy for me to say because I know they want an open-ended meditative practice and people recommend that meditation should be open-ended, but if someone is using one of these devices and doesn't have much instruction and all they're getting is rain as a feedback, they might feel helpless and not want to use the Muse head Band. So I think that it's awesome that Muse has included a lot of guided meditations to help teach you, but I think that they should put out maybe a little bit more information on how to structure your meditation sessions starting out so that people have more success. And that's why I wrote my book, Muse Meditation Mastery, because I think that people feel like they have more control over their sessions and have more confidence for engaging in the technology. All right, so that's it for today. If you wanna learn more specifically for me using the Muse headband with the Mind Lift system, be sure to check out the Brain Circuit Training Program, fill out an application. I'm relaunching next month with completely new videos and totally revamped from everything that I learned from the previous cohorts. And I'm excited to work with some of you that uh, do decide to sign up. Uh, if you haven't already, check out my Instagram for behind the scenes content. And that's it for today. Thanks so much. Dr. Cody Rawl signing off. Talk to you next time. The circuit at, uh, sitting itself, uh, training all these waves, in my opinion, is, is, is very powerful. But uh, who would knew that a high beta like me would 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 benefit from alpha first and then go? Who would knew that? Uh, theta. Yeah. Whether my theta is interfering, or whether whether it's um, beta interfering in terms of the alpha. Um, so now now with you, it never occurred to me that that theta was an issue okay, until until we started working together. So that was really interesting. That's one of the highlights for me.